this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Everywhere I go I'm gonna let it shine Everywhere I go I'm gonna let it shine Everywhere I go I'm gonna let it shine Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's so great to be here tonight. I'm so thankful for how this has come together. And I pray that it will be valuable for you, not only for your intellect, but for your heart, for mission, and that it will, we will leave here changed, even just a tiny bit. Uh, I want to uh, first ask Brad to come forward because... This really wouldn't have happened without Brad and Grace as well, who helped in all of this. And I just want to find out, so for those of us who don't know who Brad is and, and what is it that, that's going on next door, it's something called Connect, is that right? That's right. So is that like a, um, is that electricity company or is it a dating service or <laughs> what is it? It could be an electricity company, couldn't it? Or a dating service? Uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's not oh, that. Okay. No, what, no. What, what is Connect? We do connect people though, so, well, what... What does Connect do? So, um, firstly, we partner with the local church. So, um, uh, people who are interested in reaching out um, to people who don't know Jesus, but that means reaching out across culture and language. So, um, learning culture, learning language, and um, being able to communicate truth to those people who would have no other way of knowing mm -hmm. unless somebody went to them. Wow. So, so, yeah, so we'll partner with the local church to do that. So... Um, the way we do that is a, uh, it's non-residential training, so it's online and we do workshops and training events and retreats like we're having around the corner yeah. and um, partner with the local church as they continue to live their life in community in a local church and train there as well. Yeah. And to, to find out more about that, how would we go about doing that? A website or something? Yeah, yeah. So connectministrytraining.com okay. and uh, that will tell you everything you need to know or... You come and talk to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah, so most people will um, see us on social media or um, through connect word of mouth through the participants who are already in the program or have been in the program in the past and uh, local church connections and through the website. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks, Nathan. I'm super pleased that we've had this partnership. The more networking we have, the more opportunities are created to uh, see the gospel go forward into the world and so 
what a wonderful thing. So check that out if you want to. Ch- if that sparks something in your mind, check it out. See what's going. Uh, we have Sam Green with us now. Sam and I went to college together, uh, Bible College, and I think for s- we sat together for maybe three years. I don't know. So you know, it's it was good. It was good, and. Uh, so I'm so super happy when, when uh, Sam said, oh, I'm coming up your way, somewhere up your way, might be nearby. <laughs> I said, it's next door. <laughs> so it worked out really well. And then uh, talking to Brad and Grace as well about possibly having this event here and benefiting from it, and it's happening. So we're so pleased with that. There will be a question time later on. So if you have a question during Sam's presentation, please make sure you just take a note, note it down. Then the, that mic will become alive and you'll be invited to come up and ask your question from that mic and Sam will just have the perfect answer every time. We'll see. Maybe, maybe not. We'll give him a, we'll give him a bit of a space. So let me pray and then I'm going to hand you over to Sam. Our Heavenly Father, there is... Nothing more important than you receiving glory. And you are glorified when people bow the knee to your son. And Father, it is therefore our great desire that not just locals, people we know, bow the knee, but people from every tribe and language and nation. And so, Father, we... Knowing your great plan, we pray that you would help us to fit our lives into that plan, to give ourselves to that, to have the same priorities, to have the same passion. And so, Father, tonight we pray, as particularly we think about the Muslim world, we ask, Father, that you would continue to open Muslim hearts all over the world so that they can see the glory, your glory in the face of the Lord Jesus. And Father, we pray that you would be pleased tonight as Sam speaks. Please help Samuel to uh, speak clearly and graciously and lovingly and gently. And we pray, Father, that you would do a work in each one of us so that we would have a greater prayerfulness for the nations of which we are a part. And Father, we pray that you would do a great work in us tonight. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me uh, ask Samuel to come on up. You might want to introduce yourself a little bit. Don't tell any stories about me. <laughs> Nathan and I were very good friends at college and we've, I've had the joy of being able to keep up with him over these years. And uh, thank you, Nathan, for hosting Connect and myself here tonight. And it's great to be with you all. Let's put this down a bit. Uh, so my name's Samuel Green and... I come from Sydney. I've, I work with the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students as, um, I guess you could say, a, a campus missionary. Uh, and I've been doing that for 22 years uh, with local students, overseas students. But I'm also the AFES Islamic Specialist. And so I've been doing that Islamic work for probably about 25 years. And that involves uh, training people in some ways that you will see tonight. Uh, It involves writing. It involves a lot of talking with Muslims and evangelism, a lot of public debating with Islamic lecturers. And, um, yeah, basically evangelism and training of Christians. And um, I've got a website called engagingwithislam.org, which has... um, all the material there. Um, I'm married, have five children, and I live in Tasmania. And so I was expecting it to be really hot up here, actually. And I've come up and it's very mild. It's so I expect the mainland to be, um, you know, very hot, but it's not. So that, that's a real joy that it can be a bit cooler like Tasmania. In fact, I think Tassie's warmer than we are here today. I'm going to make a start. Welcome again. The subject tonight is, as you can see, the crucifixion 
of Jesus in Christianity and Islam. Now, why am I doing this subject? Well, I'm doing it because it's a significant point of difference between Islam and Christianity. For Christians, we, we just assume that Jesus was crucified and we have very good reason for this. Uh, we're taught from the Bible and from history that Jesus was crucified and killed on a Roman cross around the year 33 AD. And his death on the cross is a central part of the Christian faith. It's a central part of, of the story of God's interaction with this world. However, and many of you may not know this or you may, the Muslim world, which is about 1.8 billion people, is actually taught something different. They're taught that Jesus only appeared to be crucified. He only appeared to be crucified and killed. Uh, Muslim leaders give a variety of explanations as to what happened and we're going to be looking at those. And so the This is a point of difference between Christianity and Islam. In Christianity, the death of Jesus is absolutely central. In Islam, it's something that appeared to happen. And so, uh, for those of us who are Christians and want Muslim people to uh, share in the blessings of the gospel, we, we need them to accept that Jesus died on the cross. And if you're a Muslim here tonight... Uh, you, you, you probably want to see what evidence I've got that Jesus did die on the cross. And so, for us who are Christians, though, we need to think about how do we bring the gospel message to Muslims because not only do they believe that, or not only are they taught that Jesus didn't die for our sins, it's actually even more that Islam commonly teaches, and that is that he wasn't even on the cross. And so, you can see that that's an extra stumbling block, that Jesus wasn't even crucified. And so, across the last 1,400 years, as Christians have been engaging with Muslims, this has been a sticking point, and I feel that we haven't made a lot of progress in this area. I'll be showing what the Bible says and what history says, but tonight I want to do something different for you, and that is I want us to take a good look at what the Quran says. And so that's where I'll be spending probably half my time and then the other half will be on what the Bible and history says. But I actually think that looking at what the Quran says will surprise many people and will surprise Muslims. When I was writing my book, I thought I knew what the Quran says. I have some copies of my book over there and I'm I'm going to give you a summary of the chapter on the cross. Um, I, I assumed I knew what the Quran says until I started to study it and study Islamic scholars. And I actually thought that this is not necessarily a point in which Christians and Muslims have to disagree. And I believe that this is actually uh, potentially a great way forward for Christians being able to explain to Muslims that Jesus was crucified because we can actually show it from the Quran itself. And uh, I believe this is a a new shift that we could have in our dialogue which would be uh, fruitful and actually lead to some significant change and uh, new areas for the gospel to go. So this is what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to look at the crucifixion in the Quran and its interpretation. I'm going to look at the Bible, and then I'm going to look at history outside of the Bible. So let's get straight into it. Here's the first one. So what I want to do now is to look at the Islamic explanations as to what happened to Jesus. Because as I said, the Quran says Jesus only appeared to die. But what does that mean? What does it mean? What's interesting is that Muslims have a huge number of explanations as to what it means. And I'm just going to go through these really quickly now. I'm not going to evaluate each one. I'm just going to show you each one. And then we're going to look at uh, the Quran in a bit more detail. So let's look at the first of these. Explanation one. No one was crucified. It was a vision. In this explanation, there was no historical crucifixion. People saw an illusion or a communal vision. Therefore, Jesus only appeared to be crucified to those who saw the vision, but, not, but, but this was not the reality. So that's uh, the first interpretation that, that you'll hear around. The second one was that no one was crucified, but it's all just a myth. The crucifixion of Jesus is just a myth that developed over time. So again, there's no historical crucifixion event. 
it's a myth that developed over time and uh, people today might think that it happened and it appears to people that it happened, but that's because it's a myth that's just developed and other myths are believed and appear to be true. Okay. The third explanation, which is probably the most common one that you'll hear, is this substitution theory. This is that there was a real crucifixion and it appeared to be Jesus, but it was in fact someone else. Many classical Islamic scholars hold this view. The idea of a substitute itself doesn't come from the Quran or from the teachings of Muhammad, uh, but it comes from other teachings that interpret the Quran. There are probably about 11 different explanations within this category, saying that it was Judas or a volunteer disciple or it was a mix-up with Barabbas or Simon of Cyrene. There are all these variations that they have around who it was. And so they say that God made um, Judas's face look like Jesus and so they arrested Judas or something like that. Uh, but that's uh, number three. Number four... And number four is actually held by very significant scholars. This is by uh, Abdullah Madudi and Sayyid Qatab. And these are the, the main reformers of Islam who have led to the Muslim Brotherhood movement throughout the Muslim world, which is a massive uh, orthodox movement, and to, to the Pakistani revival and all those people. And so th these are significant scholars that I'm quoting here. Now, in this view, they say we don't really know what happened. Uh, they say we don't know any more than what the verses of the Quran say. And these verses only say that the Jewish leaders did not kill Jesus, even though it appeared they did. Let me just read to you from um, Madudi. He says, The Quran explicitly states that the Jews did not succeed in putting Jesus to death and that Allah raised him to himself. But it is silent about the nature and details of the matter and does neither ex say explicitly whether Allah raised Jesus in body and soul together from the earth to some place in heaven or that he died like other mortals and only his soul was raised to heaven. Therefore, on the basis of the Quran, neither aspect can be definitely denied or affirmed. So I hope you can see that when you start reading the Islamic scholars, this idea that Jesus is appearing is starting to get quite a few interpretations and some are saying, well, his body could well have been there, but it was his soul taken up. Explanation five, uh, this is that Jesus was crucified by the Romans, not the Jewish leaders. Now, this comes about because the Quran says that the Jewish leaders did not kill or crucify Jesus. It doesn't actually say Jesus was not crucified or killed. It's actually something different. The Quran never says Jesus was not crucified. It says the Jews did not crucify him. And so this has led some interpreters to say, uh, it, well, that's actually correct because the Jews didn't do it. It was the Romans who did it. And so the Jews who are boasting of killing Jesus are being told, well, you didn't. Right. Maybe that's what it's saying. Explanation six is an interesting one. This is that the body of Jesus was crucified, but his soul was taken without death. His body was crucified, but his soul was taken without death. Now, this might sound a little unusual to us, but that's because Islam has a completely different doctrine of death to Christians. Sometimes we think that Christians and Muslims believe sort of the similar things. We always believe nothing the same. Islam has a completely different understanding of what death is. So in this understanding, uh, Jesus' body left his soul without him dying and only his body was crucified and so he appeared to die. Now this idea is based on a teaching in the Quran that God takes our soul not only at death but also when we are asleep without death. So I'll just quote you from uh, Surah 33, 39, verse 42. God takes the souls at the time of their death and in their sleep, those who have not died. And so you see, Islam's got a very different doctrine of even what it means to die. The Quran even says that you were dead before God gave you life. What, what does that mean? Right? So when we talk about death and when the Quran talks about death, it, 
it's not talking about a medical understanding. It's actually saying that every time you go to sleep, Allah takes your soul and if he wills, he'll give it back to you and if not, you, you just won't wake up, you'll, you'll be dead. Now that's a very different understanding of death, isn't it? Again, we read, we'll, we'll be reading these verses of the Quran and we can think, uh, we can come to it with our medical 20th century understanding of death. We need to understand the Quran on its own terms. And according to the Quran, you die, it's called the little death, every time you go to sleep. That's how the Muslims think. I know that's different, but we need to take the Quran on its own terms to see what it's saying. The next idea is uh, number seven, and that is that the Quran is refuting the Jewish Talmud. This explanation says that the Quran is refuting the death of Jesus as it is presented in the Jewish Talmud. The Talmud says that Jesus was stoned first and then later on crucified. That's what the Talmud records about Jesus. And it, it, uh, the, the, the Islamic scholars who hold this view, they say that the Quran is correcting this false view by saying Jesus wasn't stoned and then, uh, and then crucified. Thus, the Quran's not rejecting the Bible, it's rejecting uh, the Jewish account in the Talmud. The eighth uh, uh, interpretation is that Jesus was crucified, but he survived. Uh, this is held by the Ahmadi sect within Islam and also by Shabir Ali, who is one of the major internet Islamic speakers in the world. Uh, and so it's, it's held by a significant Muslim, significant Muslim presence on the, uh, on the world stage. And this is the idea that when Jesus was crucified, he fainted and he appeared to have died, but he survived. And so when the Quran is saying that they didn't kill him uh, and he only appeared to die, what that means is that you know, he was crucified, but he, he didn't die from it. It looked like he was, but he survived. And so they didn't succeed in killing him. The last one that I want us to look at is um, number nine, and that is that Jesus was crucified and the Quran is describing him as a martyr. Now, this explanation is based on the fact that the Quran says that martyrs only appear to die. Martyrs only appear to die. And that in actual fact, they've been raised up to be with Allah. Uh, martyrs in uh, Islamic jihadist martyrs go straight to paradise. And so uh, the Quran is describing the unseen realities of the crucifixion. Now, I'm just going to conclude here. I just want you to see that when Muslims say Jesus was not crucified, they're actually on fairly shaky ground when they say that from the Quran. Because I've given you nine different interpretations that Islamic scholars, very prominent Islamic scholars, hold. And most of them actually have Jesus on the cross. Right? It, it's surprising to see how diverse these explanations are and how many of them involve Jesus being crucified. And if you are a Muslim here tonight, I want to ask you, which Islamic explanation do you believe? Which one do you believe? And, and why do you believe it? If you have a Muslim friend, this is the type of question you can ask them. I have, uh, each chapter in my book uh, talks about sharing the gospel. You know, one will talk about sharing the gospel, the next will talk about the, the incarnation, the trinity, salvation. And uh, each chapter will give you the information you need. Then it has a summary at the end of each chapter. So you can go back and quickly revisit everything through the summary. And then... Each chapter has an evangelistic booklet online that you can get printed off. And so if you have a Muslim friend, you can read the chapter and then you've, you can download this A5 booklet and give to them. And so if you've got one and, and they're talking about not believing in the, the crucifixion of Jesus, you've, you can actually get one of these booklets and, and give to them. And it will take you through what I've just taken through uh, you through there. But the point is... Muslims don't know what happened with Jesus. They have no idea. Some of their most prominent scholars leading some of the biggest movements in the world today saying, well, maybe he was crucified. I, I can't say he was or wasn't because there's just not enough information in the Quran. And um, I, want you to, I want Christians to understand that. What I want to do now, though, is I want us to 
um, let the Quran interpret itself. Because as an evangelical Christian, what I seek to do is to read the Bible carefully and to let the Bible explain itself. And so I take those exact same skills that I've learnt uh, when I was at college and that I've put into practice of letting the Bible explain itself, I apply that to the Quran. And in fact, when you read the Islamic books of interpretation called tafsir, uh, this is what they say too. They say the first interpreter of the Quran is the Quran itself. So I want to go through the verses that speak about the crucifixion of Jesus and actually just say, how does the Quran interpret this? What should we be thinking? Because as I said, this is something that stops Muslims hearing the gospel. And so we need to make some progress in this area. And I believe uh, that we need to do that from within the Quran itself. Let's look at these verses. Um, here we go. They, the Jewish leaders said, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ about this are full of doubts with no knowledge, but only assumption to follow. For of certainty they killed him not. Rather, God raised him to himself. Now, when you first read that, it may look like a straight-out denial of the crucifixion. But as I pointed out before, it does not say Jesus was not crucified or killed. It says the Jews did not crucify and kill him. And it says that it was made to appear. So what does that mean? And it's because of this description that you've got these nine different interpretations that I've shown you. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to go through section by section and see how the rest of the Quran picks up these exact same ideas. Let's look at the first of it here. Um, when we look at those verses, what do we see? There's actually four main points. So the first point is, um, let me just swing around here, that there are people who are boasting of killing and crucifying Jesus, but they're told they didn't. That's the first point, isn't it? The second point is, but it appeared that they did. It was made to appear to them. Those who disagree with this have no certain knowledge. And God raised Jesus to himself. So I'm just going to read the rest of the Quran now, which I've done. I read the Arabic. So I've done the whole thing. I've read it many times. And I'm going to look at how does the rest of the Quran pick up those same ideas and explain them for us. Well, let's have a look at the first of this. So what does the Quran mean when it says that someone is boasting of having, to ki of having killed somebody and then they're told you didn't kill them? Well, we actually see this elsewhere. So we've got here, they said, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God, but they killed him not nor crucified him. So how does the rest of the Quran understand this idea? What's interesting is that the Quran speaks about this type of thing elsewhere, not just here, but also elsewhere. So if you have a look at uh, up on the screen there, chapter 8, verse 17, it says, you did not kill them, God killed them. That's interesting, isn't it? You didn't kill them. This is exactly what we've read with the crucifixion account. Now, this is speaking about the jihadists. So the, the Mujahideen, the jihadist soldiers of Muhammad, who were boasting about killing Muhammad's enemies in the Battle of Badar. It's a very famous battle um, in Islamic history. And so these jihadists are boasting about having killed Muhammad's enemies. And what does Allah say in the Quran? You didn't kill them. You didn't kill them. I killed them. You see, the, the Quran, it, it, this is actually the way the Quran is speaking about Jesus. You didn't do it. Right? It, it's it's a, a similar idea. Uh, when we read the Quran, we see that you cannot boast of giving or of taking life. You can't boast of giving or of taking life because the giving and taking of life is only at God's command. Now, the Quran is not denying that the jihadist soldiers who killed Muhammad's enemies historically didn't kill them. It, it acknowledges that they did that. But yet when God, in the, uh, the Allah in the Quran, gives his interpretation, he says that only Allah can take life. And so he says, you didn't kill them. Well, 
Um, I want to say that that's quite similar to what we find in the crucifixion when we look elsewhere in the Quran. What about the next section? The next section is, um, according to the Quran, what does it mean when someone only appears to die? So we've, we've, uh, the, I'll read that part of the verse out. And so it was made to appear to them. It was made to appear to them that Jesus was dead. Now, what does that mean? Well, when we read the rest of the Quran, we see that that is how martyrs are described. So you see there, do not say those who are killed in the way of God dead. So when, a, a, when a, an Islamic martyr dies, you are not to say they're dead. No, they are living, but you don't perceive that. Right? How does it appear to you? It appears that they're dead, but you're not to say they're dead because they're alive. Do not reckon those who are killed in God's way as dead. No, they are alive with their Lord. So the martyr appears to be dead. We'll, we'll come back to this uh, in a moment. Uh, you know, so th this verse is referring to the martyrs of Islam who have died in the cause of Allah. Notice what is said about them. They're not dead, though it appears they are. Instead, they are alive with Allah in paradise. Now, the Quran is claiming here to reveal the unseen reality of the martyr. Therefore, Muslims are not to speak of martyrs as dead. They are considered living martyrs, even though it does not appear that way. Now, I'm going to give you a quote from Sayyid Qatab. And as I said, he's one of the founders of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, which is a huge movement throughout the Islamic world. And let me just read to you how he talks about the martyr. He says, to all intents and purposes, those people, the martyrs, may very well appear lifeless, but life and death are not judged by superficial uh, physical means alone. According to Islamic tradition, people who are killed for the cause of God are not washed or prepared for burial in the conventional way, but buried in the clothes they happen to be wearing because they are considered clean, pure, and because in reality they are not dead. <laughs> You see how they've got a very different understanding of death? Right? So if, if I was to die an Islamic martyr now, you would bury me in these clothes because you don't have to put grave clothes on me because I'm not dead. And so when they bury their martyrs, they bury them in the clothes they're in because they're not dead. Again, this is, we, we've got to interpret the Quran on its own terms. Um, but who are the living martyrs? those who are killed in God's cause and God's cause alone. And, and I want to suggest to you that the Quran's description of the crucifixion is describing Jesus in this way. His death is denied, though he appears to be dead. And it's speaking of him in the way it's commanding Muslims to speak of the martyrs. Now let's look at the next section. The next section reads... Um, and those who differ about this are full of doubts, with no knowledge but only assumption to follow, for of certainty they killed him not. And so here the Quran saying, those who don't listen to what the Quran's saying, that they've only got assumption to follow. It's just assumption. They don't have true knowledge. Now, what does it mean, according to the Quran, to, uh, to not have this true knowledge? Well, you see, the Quran sees itself. The Quran sees itself as the source of true knowledge because it reveals the seen and the unseen. And this is a theme that comes up, I think there's about 40 references, 40 verses like this in the Quran. It's a major theme that the Quran reveals the unseen to you. So you see that there. Allah is the knower of the unseen and the, and the witnessed, the grand and the exalted. And so the Quran is telling you the unseen. It's telling you what you can't see. And so if, 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 uh, if you're not going to listen to the Quran, you've just got assumption. You just go, you're just going by what appears to be the case. Okay? Those who reject the Quran reject this unseen knowledge. They only see the appearance of things and do not know the unseen realities. Therefore, when the Quran is describing the crucifixion, it's claiming to reveal the unseen realities of what happened to Jesus, not only the things that appeared to happen. Now, the last section that I want to look at 
is uh, this verse, the last part of the verse. Rather, God raised Jesus to himself. Now, what does that mean? How does the rest of the Quran talk about Jesus, you know, people being taken up to Allah? Well, it actually does. It talks about it on several occasions. We read these verses here. Uh, well, actually, I'll read these notes here. The Quran finishes by saying that God raised him to himself. But what does this mean? Well, look at the first verse. If you are killed or die in God's way, pardon and mercy from God are better than what they collect, that is, those who don't die on jihad. If you die or are killed, you will be gathered up to God. And so in Islamic theology, the jihadists go straight to the jihadist martyrs go straight to paradise. They go straight to paradise. They don't go into the grave. They're, they're, they're with God right now. Uh, do not reckon those who are killed in God's way as dead. No, they are alive with their Lord. That is, the souls of the martyrs are immediately taken up to be with God in paradise. This is the unseen reality. Surah uh, chapter 4, verse 158 does not say that Jesus' body was taken up. Christians can read that and go, oh, that's talking about the ascension. But it never says his body was taken up. It just says Jesus was taken up and every martyr is taken up. So according to the Quran, this is what happens to the soul of every martyr. God gives martyrs special treatment. And so it may well be that Jesus is the prime example of this within the Quran. Now, the point I want to make out of this is, as you can see, as we've just read through the Quran and allowed the ideas in the verses about the crucifixion to, to be explained by other verses within the Quran, which is, I've just tried to do what I do with the Bible, to, to see how the Bible has the similar ideas and interprets itself. We see that Jesus, as a martyr, makes sense of what the Quran says. It actually does make sense. It fits in. And there are Islamic scholars who hold to this view. It also makes sense with the rest of the Quran, because in the rest of the Quran, Jesus preaches jihad and martyrdom. Uh, it also has him, his life being paralleled to the life of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is, is, was a martyr. Uh, Islam agrees with that. And so I want to suggest that this is actually a way forward that we can engage with the Islamic world in a new way. Not just by showing what the Bible says, which I will do in a moment. Not just by looking at what history says, which I'll do in a moment. We've been doing that for a long time. I want to suggest that we need to now actually look at what the Quran says in the same way that Paul quoted from the Greek poets in Acts 17. And to say to Muslims, and I've, I've said this in several debates now, and they've got no response to this. They have no answer to this. I've had, um, I've had three debates on this subject with uh, Islamic scholars from Sydney University, from the UK and South Africa, and they, they have no response to this because I'm just carefully exegeting the text um, as an evangelical. Um, and so I actually believe that this is uh, something that we need to do for our engagement with the Islamic world. So if you want to pray for me for something, pray that across the next 20 years I can take this further into the Islamic world because what I would love to see is that in 20 years' time, Jesus as a martyr is the accepted position across the Islamic world and that we've just taken them one step. We've got Jesus on the cross because um, that, that's what we need to do. We've actually got two steps with them. We've got to get him on the cross first and then explain what his cross is. Now, what about the Bible? Let's just uh, do, do this quickly now, because the Bible is very clear when it comes to uh, the, the death of Jesus. Um, I'll just read these out from here. At that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Now, Jesus is clear. You know, if, if you're a Muslim, the, the Bible is clear on this. Now, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. 
And again, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. And then on the night before Jesus was crucified, he said, uh, it, it, it's written, and he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. All of the gospel accounts record that Jesus was crucified and died. Uh, when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. That's in the Gospel of Matthew. In Mark, they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but, they, uh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. In Luke's Gospel, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And finally, John's Gospel, finally Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. So the Bible is very clear that Jesus is crucified. Um, the apostles of Jesus teach this same idea. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, fleeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. We preach Christ crucified. That's what Christians have been doing from the beginning. So the Bible is clear that Jesus was crucified. And as Christians, we have no doubt about this. And I want to say that um, Islam just doesn't have a consistent message on this. And so if a Muslim says to you, Jesus wasn't crucified, I want to say they don't really have a, evidence for that. They're not even sure what their own book means. There is no consistent story. Let's just briefly look at history. Um, Josephus is a, a first century Roman, his, uh, first century Jewish historian. And uh, he actually talks a, a lot about people associated in the Bible dying. And, uh, and so he says, now some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God and that was very justly as punishment of what he did against John, that was called the Baptist. For Herod slew him, who was a good man, and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue, both as righteousness towards one another and also piety towards God, and so to come to baptism. You see, Josephus records for us what the Jews knew in Jerusalem in the first century. And so he records John the Baptist, who is in the Bible. He also records... Uh, Jesus' brother and how Jesus' brother died. And what's interesting is that in the early church, they didn't have any scripture about how Jesus' brother died. So if you read a, history, a church historian like Eusebius, who's writing in the 4th century, he actually relies on Josephus to find out about Jesus' brother. He doesn't rely on scripture, he relies on Josephus. And what are we told? We're told that Festus was now dead, Al Albinus was upon the road, and he, Annas, the high priest assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James and some others or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. So Josephus records John the Baptist for us and he's not copying the Bible there, that's his own, he's just an independent historical source. And he talks about Jesus' brother being killed and again we actually rely on him so he's not copying the bible here at all there are no christian sources about what happened to james's brother so jesus brother we completely rely on that from outside of the bible uh, and, and he talks about jesus um, this is actually an arabic version um, which i won't go into now but it, it, it's probably a better version of of josephus at this point this arabic one from a christian uh, at this time there was a wise man who was called jesus and his conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and from among the nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. As we continue to read in history, 
we see that the Roman historian Tacitus, who is our main source of Roman history, he writes that Crestus, the founder of the name, Christians, had undergone the, pen the death penalty in the reign of Emperor Tiberius by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. So in general Roman history, the Romans record what they did to Jesus. And they, they're saying that they gave him the ultimate, the, the, uh, the, the, the death penalty, and uh, that was crucifixion. The final one we'll look at is from the Jewish Talmud, which says that Yeshua, or Jesus, was hanged on Passover Eve. Now, amongst historians, Jesus' crucifixion is an established fact. <laughs> there are no historians anywhere who doubt the crucifixion of Jesus. And so this is uh, E.P. Sanders, who, who's not a Christian by any means. E.P. Sanders writes uh, stuff, you know, doubting and discarding much of the New Testament as he reconstructs his history, but he's your, he's your standard historian. And he says, Jesus was executed on the orders of the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate. Um, and there are even Muslim scholars who, who will say this. He was betrayed by the Jews and crucified. Allah lifted him to the heavens. That's from Professor Masud al-Hassan. Um, uh, th th this is a Jewish historian, a Jewish historian, uh, Gezar Verms. He says, it was not on a Jewish religious indictment, but on a secular accusation that he, Jesus, was condemned by the emperor's delegate to die shamefully on a Roman cross. And you, you see, this is just Jesus the Jew, a historian's reading of the Gospels. And uh, for those of you who know Bart Ehrman, Bart Ehrman is no friend of Christianity. He uh, is doing all that he can, it would seem, to turn people away from Christianity. But even he will say, I am convinced beyond a shadow of doubt that Jesus was physically crucified and died on the cross. That is the rock bottom, that is rock bottom and certain in all of my books. So just to conclude... Uh, the crucifixion of Jesus is actually an, a really important subject. And if you're a Muslim here tonight, I, I want you to consider what I've shown from the Quran, that the Quran is in no way clear in denying the crucifixion. And that if we let the Quran interpret itself, Jesus as a martyr seems to be actually a much better interpretation. And I'm yet to hear from any Muslims to the contrary. And so it doesn't need to be something that we differ about. And I would encourage you, if you're a, a, a Muslim, to look at the fact that the, the Bible is clear on this. The Gospel, the Injil, says over and over again that Jesus was crucified. And that all historians, uh, whether they're Christian or not Christian, and most of them are not Christian in the, in the, the, his, the history departments, they all agree that Jesus was crucified. It's a historical fact. And so, I'm going to say to you, Jesus was crucified. I'd like to go further and say that Jesus was crucified as the plan of God for him to, to die for your sins as that perfect sacrifice. And that God has done something for you, to save you. I don't want to go too far down that though, because if you are a Muslim, I, I just want you to get Jesus on the cross. That, that's what I want you to see today. Because there is overwhelming evidence that he was. And there is really, at this point, no reason for Christians and Muslims to disagree. I'll finish up there. Thank you for your attention and we'll um, have some questions. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Samuel. I'd uh, just like to give you one minute just to reset your brain, think, chat with the person next to you, think about what sort of question you might think is important to ask. I have a question and I will ask that in a minute, but just to give you a minute now to, um, to think. Go for it. Your time starts now.
up to? Okay. I have a question. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, what you've presented tonight says to me that the Quran seems conflicted and the other writings, the Hadith, about the death of Christ on the cross. So just a question behind that. What, what, is, the, what is Islam's understanding of inspiration of their scripture? And what does that what what impact does that have when thinking about that doctrine of inspiration have when there is confusion? Yeah. Like even I understand there's some names as well that in one document are different to another. When 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 quoting the Bible even, I, oh, that might be a, yeah. a red herring. Okay. Uh, so what's the doctrine of inspiration? Yeah. And if there's confusion, then how does that affect their understanding of inspiration? Sure. So the, the doctrine of inspiration in the Quran, uh, as it's commonly understood, is that Allah, the God of Islam, um, whose name is not Yahweh, uh, Allah, his name is Allah, he gives his word to an angel, and then that angel comes and gives that word to Muhammad. And Muhammad either hears the words or gets some impression of it and he recites those, the words accurately through that process. And so they see it, they see their doctrine of inspiration more as dictation. Now that being said, um, and again this is all in my book where you can, because this is a, an important issue which I, I bring up in one of the chapters there. When you actually read the accounts of how it was inspired to Muhammad, there were times where he would say a verse of the Quran and then somebody would put their hand up and say, but hang on, what about this? So there was a time where Muhammad said, so this is Surah 4, verse 95, where um, Muhammad said, not equal are those believers who sit at home and those who go out on jihad. Right? So those who don't go out on jihad and those who do, they're not equal before God. They're not equal before God. And there's a blind man, uh, Um bin Maktab. And this blind man goes, hang on, I'm blind. <laughs> how can I not be at, you know, how come you're putting me at a lower level when I would go out on jihad if I could, but I'm blind. If I go out there, you know, what am I going to be able to do? I'm just going to get in the way. And so then it says, then was revealed, <laughs> not equal are those who sit at home to those who go out and strive in Allah's cause, except for those who are disabled. Allah has made one a grade higher than the other. And so, so you can actually see how this works. Now, I just look at that and say, well, he's editing and composing his material. This is all in their, you know, in their most sacred writings. Um, where, you know, why didn't Allah get it right the first time? <laughs> Surely Allah would know, but you can see this, and there are many occasions for this. So, so it's dictation, but when you look at it, it it's, it's also comp comp composing things as well. Now, what does that mean for things when they're not that clear? Well, some things in the Quran are clear, some things aren't clear. And I guess there's some things like that in the Bible as well, where there might be something referred to in the Bible and we don't have a lot of information about it. Surah 3, I think it's about verse 5, um, says that Allah has made some things clear and that's the substance of the religion, but other things are not clear and, and so don't go dividing over it. And so they would just hold those together. Um, but as I said, with the Quran, I think that there is enough from elsewhere in the Quran, which speaks about similar ideas, for us to, 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 to be able to say something. And, uh, and all I want to say to my Muslim friends is that Jesus as a martyr is something that other, that, that Islamic scholars, Islamic Muslim scholars will say, they, some of them will say this. And when you look at the Quran, I, I think it's a valid interpretation. There might be a better one, but I, I just haven't seen any yet. Right. 
Luke. Um, I've just got a question, again, about the Quran and just the Islamic scriptures. I understand the Bible is made up of 66 books. It uh, ranges over 2,500 years. How does the Quran and the Islamic scriptures, what does that actually look like? And are there different levels of authority? And, um, in, and we also have the Apocrypha, which obviously in the Protestants we don't use, but um, they are historical documents. Uh, are, are there things like that? And yeah, how does that work? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, the Bible is not one book, as Luke pointed out. It's not one book, but a collection of many books from many prophets over about a 1,500-year period, so from Moses to Jesus. And so it has, you know, the law of Moses, the Psalms, the books of the prophets, the, uh, um, you know, the, the books of the gospel. You know, it's got all those books. The Quran is very different. It is completely one man. The Quran is one man. It's Muhammad. Now, he claims that what he spoke was from the angel who spoke to him. Okay, but it's still one man. And so you need to understand that, that Islam is the religion of one man who tells you what to believe about the prophets. It's very different to us as Christians, because as Christians, and I assume for those of you who attend this church, and I know Nathan, I know what he'd be doing, he'd be teaching you the book of Genesis, the law of Moses. He'd be teaching you the Psalms. He'd be teaching you all of the scriptures. And as Christians, we don't have one prophet that we follow. We actually read all of the prophets and they lead us to Jesus. Right? And, and this is the big difference between Christianity and Islam. Islam is one man telling you what to believe about the prophets. So the Quran is almost like a book of interpretation. It interprets the stories that you find in the Bible and says, this is what they mean. Right? Now, as Christians, we don't do that. We, we've actually taken a much harder path we could have just followed the Apostle Paul. There was a man in the early church who wanted to do that, Marcion. For those of you who study church history, he wanted to get rid of all the Old Testament. And he wanted to get rid of most of the Gospels except for some of Luke. And he just wanted to keep the writings of Paul. And so Christianity, now we didn't go that way, and there was no way we were going to go that way because we believe all the prophets. And so as Christians, we've actually taken the much harder path of having to read all of the prophets. And so th this is a really important thing to, to understand. Islam is actually exactly the same as the Baha'i religion. If you um, may not be familiar with the Baha'i religion, it comes about in Persia in the, the 1850s or something, and it, it's got millions of followers around the world. And the Baha'is believe in Jesus. The Baha'is believe in, Mo in Moses. The Baha'is believe in Muhammad. You cannot be a Baha'i unless you love Muhammad, unless you love Jesus, unless you love Moses, unless you love all the prophets. But you only believe what, that they only believe what their prophet says about those people. Right? So that's very different, isn't it? See, I, I don't have anyone really telling me what the law of Moses means. I, like I'm reading Genesis, I've just finished reading um, Deuteronomy, I'm going through the Bible, I just finished reading Deuteronomy, and I don't have someone telling me what Deuteronomy means, I'm just reading it and trying to understand it myself. Talk about it with other Christians, but we, we just read Moses. It's not just that I just have Paul telling me what it means and I don't read it anymore, I, I read it. And you need to realise as Christians how unique we are in, in the world religions. Most of the religions around the world have one person who tells their followers what to believe about everyone else. Now, if you're a Christian, you're not like that. You, you need to realise how weird it is that you read the Psalms. You, you think nothing of that. I've had a Muslim come to my church and say to me, why, do you, why did you have a sermon on the Psalms? And I said, well, because we're preaching the Psalms. He goes, no, why did you have a sermon on the Psalms? And I said, well, that's just what we're doing at the moment. And he said to me, the Psalms have got nothing to do with Christianity. Right? He thinks we've got a book called the Gospel or something doesn't even know what it is. Right? Muslims don't realise that Christians actually read all of the prophets and that what we believe about God comes from all of the prophets. And I want to say that for you Christians, you are unique in world religions. There's no other religion like us. We believe and read all the prophets. Now, I'll get, I'm going to get to your question now. Um, 
what is, uh, so our canon is, is uh, the Bible, and for Protestants, we have 66 books. There are other canons amongst the, the churches. Some have some other books in them. If you go up to Ethiopia, um, where no one ever colonised or conquered Ethiopia, they've got their own Bible up there. It's, it's our one with a few extra books on how to baptise and various things. Um, but there's never been one group in charge of Christianity to enforce one Bible, which is actually good. It just means the Bible's just out there. There are different regions, the Bible's out there, and so there are these different canons. In the Quran, so, sorry, in Islam, they have different canons too. There are actually 10 different Arabic Qurans used in the world today. Again, my book has all the details on there, um, or you go to my website and you, you can see the details, um, and I've got a booklet, an evangelistic booklet on that too. So there are 10 different Arabic Qurans used in the world today. They're all quite similar but there are thousands of small differences between them. Sometimes Muslims will say to Christians, the Bible's corrupted and there's one perfect Quran. It's just nonsense. There are ten, at least 10 different... In fact, there's a lady in London who's been collecting different Arabic Qurans and she's over, got over 30 of them now. These were canonised in the 4th Islamic century. There were a lot more different collections of the Quran. There were Qurans with different numbers of chapters, different chapters arranged differently, different verses within the chapters. Um, they were standardised early and made a canonical version. That one developed into a whole range of new versions for other reasons and then 10 of those were chosen in the 4th Islamic century to be canonical. But the Quran is not the only writings that Muslims rely on. They also rely on what's called the Hadith. And the word hadith is in the Quran, and the Quran actually describes itself as a hadith, but it means an account, a story. And so there are these encyclo old, old school encyclopedia sets, not, not um, stuff online, but there are these multi volumes and volumes of these sayings and doings of Muhammad. And when it comes to those, Muslims differ widely. Some Muslims will accept six canonical hadith, uh, although even amongst that, those they pick and choose them uh, from among them. Others, so, so Shia Muslims have different hadith to Sunni Muslims because they, they don't like the f certain followers of Muhammad and the, the Sunnis don't like certain followers of Muhammad from the Shia side and so that, they don't accept each other's hadith. There are increasing number of Muslims who don't accept any hadith and so, but the hadith are absolutely essential to the Islamic uh, canon, right, to what, to what to do. So the Quran never says pray five times a day. That comes from the hadith. So these books are absolutely essential, but Muslims hold com completely different views on which ones to keep. So our, our, Quran, our Bibles may have different books amongst ourselves, but the Muslims have a huge variety of canons, uh, you know, volumes and volumes different um, and so they have their own you know for some they would view a whole lot of it as apocryphal but other people would view it as true and that does that sort of answer your question there that's the big picture all right yes sir hello i'm lachlan hi lachlan um, a lot of your uh argument about Islamic beliefs about the crucifixion of Jesus, it's based on um, disagreements within Islam. Um, but often there are disagreements within Christianity. Um, a lot of Christians have different beliefs about revelation or Paul's teachings on women in ministry. Um, so how can we be confident to stand on our beliefs about the Bible uh, and, and criticize uh, fractures within the beliefs of Islam when we ourselves are fractured about the Bible? Sure. Uh, well, I'd say that we're not... Uh, I don't agree that we're fractured about the Bible. I'd say that overall Christians have a lot of unity uh, in the Scriptures, as Muslims do about most of the Quran. And uh, this was actually in my notes, so thanks for bringing this up because I, I should have brought it up in my notes, that when it comes to the death of Jesus, Christians are unanimous... Um, that there are no Christian groups today saying Jesus didn't die on the cross. So, um, I'm, 
if, if I've given the impression that the whole of Islam is like Islam's understanding on the cross, well, then I apologise for that. But I, I don't think I was trying to give that. I wasn't trying to give that impression. I was just saying on this subject. And on that subject, Christians, uh, we all agree on this. So this is something we don't, we actually don't disagree on. Um, and, uh, and, and historians agree on it. So I really just have no reason to, to say that Jesus didn't die on the cross. And when I look at what Muslims say and I try to take them on their own terms, those nine things are what they're saying. And so I'm saying, well, um, I, I just don't see... like They're not clear at that point. And, and they're probably happy not to be clear at that point, but they're just not clear at that point. So um, I don't want to say that all Islam is completely fractured everywhere. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that overall they're going to be believing pretty well the same things uh, as Christians do. Yep. Thanks for that, Lachlan. Regarding evangelism and your personal experience, how long has it taken you to lead a Muslim to the Lord? Was it a long period and and just the way you, you approach that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've had the, the privilege of being involved in about three Muslims coming to faith. Um, they've come for different reasons. Um, one of them became a Christian because I just held up a Quran which, was, which had all these... They were different Qurans. I held up a couple of different Qurans. And he'd been taught that there's only one Quran and that's why Christianity is wrong. And so when I showed a couple of different Qurans and he went, wow, actually, there are different Qurans, he went, that's it, uh, Christianity is true. And so I oh, know that may not, that, that doesn't seem, but because he'd actually learnt Christianity, he'd learnt that Jesus was not the Son of God. He'd learnt that Jesus did not die on the cross. He'd learnt that there is no Father, Son and Spirit. So he'd learnt all the things that Christianity was not meant to be and his reason for believing that it wasn't those things was because the, the Quran's perfect. And then when he found out that there's wholesale burnings and standardising and different Qurans around the world, he just went, OK, I've got to think again about this. And so um, that was actually very quick for me. I just showed him some things. And within a space of months, he changed. The other ones have just been people who um, have taken their time to read through the Bible, to think, um, and then, then after a while they just became Christians. But I've, had, I've also had Iranians just turn up to church and they, I didn't have to do anything, I didn't say anything. They just came in and said, we want to become Christians. So um, I want to say that there's many different ways. Again, in my book I go through about sharing the gospel with Muslims and how I've done that. Um, that's a whole lecture in itself. It, it's actually not that hard. It's what I've been teaching up at the conference here. Um, and so it, it is actually quite easy to share the gospel with Muslims and really to introduce the gospel in an appropriate way. And, um, and yeah, that's what I do. So it happens in different ways. We basically want to think about how do we introduce the gospel in an appropriate way that becomes a bit too much for me to get into right now. Um, if I don't get another question, I will come back to it. I might give you a real summary. Hello, my name is Meredith. I can only reach the microphone. Um, I was going to ask, um, I appreciated that you structured your talk around the crucifixion and the difference in those religions, well, in Christianity and Islam. Um, but I was going to ask, since the, the crucifixion is quite a focal point of the Bible, like it defines two different sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament, what is the focal point of the Quran, like of Islam, if it's not the crucifixion, if that's so like vague? What's the pivotal message, if that makes sense? Thank you, thank you. And you're right. The, in the Quran, the crucifixion is almost just a little passing thing. It's not... It's not a big deal. For us, it's a big deal, but in the Quran, it's 
as I said, you know, it, it's probably just Jesus being an example of, of a, you know, a righteous man's death. A righteous man's death. So, um, what is the main focal point of the Quran? Um, the main focal point of the Quran is that there is one God and that Muhammad is his prophet. That's the main focal point. And so, Muhammad's great commission is Surah 9, verse 29 and following, which says, uh, Fight those who believe not in God and the last day, and do not follow what God and his messenger have, have taught uh, from those who have been given the book, that is Christians and Jews, until they pay the tribute, the jizya, out of hand and have been humbled. The Jews say Ezra is the son of God. The Christians say the Messiah is the Son of God. That is the words from their mouths conforming with the unbelievers before them. God assail them, how they are perverted. It is he who has sent his messenger with the, the revelation and the true religion to uplift it above every religion. So that's Muhammad's great commission. And if you read the books of Sharia, that's the great commission. And so when the... Uh, remember, Muhammad didn't send out missionaries... Right? Muhammad didn't send out missionaries, he sent out jihadist armies. Right? It's a part of history that we, we don't know about, but the, the jihadist armies went out and they gave people three choices. This is just standard Islamic doctrine. Right? Um, three choices, convert to Islam, pay the terms of surrender, or we will fight you. And so that's exactly what the Islamic State group were doing, and that's, that's just what Islam did for over a thousand years. Remember that Islam ruled uh, much of the, almost most of the world for over a thousand years. Right? The, the, the Western empires with their democracy are very recent to the Muslim mind. They've got over a thousand years of when they ruled. And you need to realise how fleeting the West is in the Muslim way of thinking because they've been around for heaps longer than us. Um, it's just because we, the, the Western empires, got on top uh, a couple of hundred years ago that uh, things turned around. But we, we, you know, it, it's to our peril to forget most of history. <laughs> so you, you, it, I'm just, just going to read a history book from on that period. The, um, there's a guy fr from... Um, one of the US universities is just called the Great Arab Conquests and he'll, he'll take you through that. But Muslims celebrate this, that they celebrate their, their, their imperial periods, you know. They colonised, they ins the biggest enslavers in world history. Um, it's crazy that we don't know this history. I don't know why we don't, it's just we don't. Hi Sam. Uh, I'm not very experienced in apologetics and I was just sort of wondering, um, you mentioned from 1 Corinthians, we pre preach Christ and him crucified, um, but we usually preach that from the Bible. Uh, I was wondering why it's important, um, it's exciting, but I was wondering why it's important to consider and speak about how the Quran preaches Christ crucified. Yeah. Um I'm going to tie this into this gentleman's question as well. So the way that I share the gospel, I'll take a step back. Where you fit on the historical timeline is important. So for us as Christians, we sit on the historical timeline about 600 years before the rise of Islam. What that means is that when you read the Bible, you never read about the apostles in the book of Acts evangelising Muslims because they don't exist for another 600 years. When you read the Quran, Christianity is a major subject in the Quran. We often talk about the five pillars of Islam, you know, the confession of faith, the uh, five daily prayers, the pilgrimage to Mecca, the fasting during Ramadan, and the giving of money to Islamic causes. And we, we teach those things as ways of explaining Islam. But they are actually relatively minor subjects in the Quran. Bigger subjects in the Quran are Christianity. And so the Quran speaks about the death of Jesus and says he only appeared to die. It says of the Trinity uh, that you know, the Trinity is wrong and that Jesus is not the Son of God or divine. 
It says, um, it says that God is not Father, and there is, no, there is no Son of God, there is no fatherhood of God. It, it, it prepares Muslims for almost every aspect of the gospel. So what this means is that when Christians and Muslims meet, Muslims generally have some idea about Christianity and are prepared to reject what Christians say and to engage with what Christians say. Whereas Christians, if they've learnt the Bible, they don't know what to think about Islam. They don't know what to think about it. I've, I've got lots of Muslim friends. In fact, most of my friends on Facebook are Muslims. So I've got loads of Muslim friends. They, they, we, we get on really well, actually. We have good forthright dialogue and we, we love each other and um, talk about these things. And, um, um, and, and I was talking to one of them and I was just explaining this difference about where we sit on the historical timeline and what it means for how we learn about each other. And he said, you're absolutely right. He said, in the mosque, we have whole lecture series about Christianity and how to refute it. Whereas I assume Nathan here on a Sunday, he's not having a whole series on Islam and how to refute it because it's not in the Bible. If it was in the Bible, he'd be doing that and you would, you would know something about Islam. And so Muslims have far more knowledge about Christianity than Christians have about Islam. So there's this huge disparity. And when you meet a Muslim, if you meet a, 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 any Muslim will have some idea about uh, what the gospel's not. But if you meet a Muslim who's learning their faith, um, they're ready to challenge you because that's actually the religion. And most of the converts to Islam that I've met uh, have been Anglos who have just been told how Christianity is so wrong and they go through all the ways that Christianity is wrong and then they convert to, to Islam. And uh, that's because that's what Muslims actually learn. They learn church history. Muslims learn about the Council of Nicaea and, and all this type of thing and you're going, I don't even know that. <laughs> but they learn the church history to show that, you, that Constantine corrupted the Bible and made the Bible and invented the Trinity and you know, all, all these things. Now, the result of that though, and this is for you, sir, is that Muslims are actually meant to know about Christianity. And this gives you a great opportunity. So yes, they get this preparation to talk to us. And most Muslims, if they're trained or even just have a, a basic knowledge, are going to know a lot more than the Christian knows about Islam. Um, Muslims are still meant to learn about Christianity and the door swings both ways. And so if I sit next to a Muslim or you know, a ta Muslim taxi driver or I meet a Muslim for the first time, what I ask them is I just simply say, what have you heard about Christianity? What have you been taught? So, and this is, is what I say in my book. What have you been taught about Christianity? And you find out exactly where they're coming from. You let them explain to you what they know. You, you don't assume anything. Just listen to them, find out where they're coming from. So that, that's where I begin. What have you heard about Christianity? And just listen to them. Don't try to correct them. Just, just listen to who they are and where they're coming from. Then the second thing you show them is you say, okay, can I show you one thing about Christianity? And uh, they've always said yes for me because I've listened to them and they, they're happy to have dialogue. And I say, can I show you what books are in the Bible? And I take them to the table of contents. And the table of contents is the first Bible study I have with a Muslim. And I show them that we believe all of the prophets and that we read all of the prophets. And I take them through the law of Moses, the books of Job, Jonah... All these people they know and some they don't know. And I say, see, that the Bible's not one book. It's all the prophets. And, and I explain how this is different to Islam. That Islam is one man telling you what to believe about the prophets. Whereas Christians, we actually read them. And, and that's actually really impressive. As I said, this is something that as Christians, we just assume. We just think everyone does it. They don't. Right? And so you show them that. So what have you heard about Christianity? Let me show you the table of contents and show that we follow all the prophets and that uh, the Bible is very different to the Quran. And then after that, I invite them to read Matthew's Gospel. So I always, always carry around with me a Matthew's Gospel uh, and I, I give that to people just to read. Um, my book will take you through the rest, but that's the, the truncated uh, account of, of what I do. So, but what I'm saying there is you actually don't need to know about Islam to evangelise a Muslim. Okay. I don't want you coming away from this thinking, I've got to learn all this stuff about Islam. What I've actually done is figured out a way of 
how we present the gospel in a meaningful way to Muslims. And um, there are experts like me who learn the Arabic and do the whole thing. But for most of you here, you just need to learn how to present the gospel in, in a slightly different way. You know how Paul, he, he introduced the gospel to Jews in the book of Acts in a different way to how he introduced the, the gospel to idol worshippers in Athens. He did it in different ways to different people. So I'm just saying there's a different way and that is ask what they believe about Christianity or what they've been taught, explain what the Bible is, that it's all the prophets and for them that's a big deal and then you go from there. But my book's got it all there. Nathan, is it going to finish up? There's just one question that's come online, which might be a great segue. Someone called Jesse from Scone. Uh, he just wants to know about the books that are available, both the ones you're suggesting and others that might be um, available uh, by others. So, um, I've got a few of these. These are a free book. These are by a chemical engineer called Bill Dennett. And, and this is just a nice general introduction to Islam. And um, I've just got a stack of these. And so th th this will give you some idea to, to get going. Um, and they're free. Um, I've got this book called Welcome Home. This is how you help Muslims uh, leave Islam and come into Christianity and the types of issues you'll need to face. This is from a German missionary in Africa and is excellent. It uh, goes through all the different books, uh, sorry, all the different issues they'll have. Um, this is from John Wilson. He's, uh, I think, an Anglican minister from Melbourne. And he sort of looks at parallel things, looking at Christianity and Islam issue by issue, comparing just different issues. And um, I've got a couple of those. And then there's my book, uh, Where to Start with Islam. And the idea is that I, with this book, I look at all the places where Christians often start and don't make much progress and show a better place to start. And the first half of the book is actually about not learning facts on Islam, but how we better present the gospel in a way that's meaningful. Now, you can get... These other ones that aren't online. You might um, you maybe get one or two of them from Kurong. You can get all of these from... Kur you can get mine from Kurong or from Matthias Media. So, that's it. And I've got, I've got a few over here, so... You can come and have a look. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight. And uh, thank you for Samuel to, for being here as well. And thank you to Brad with uh, Connect Access. I can't remember which one it is. Connect uh, Ministries. So hopefully uh, all those have been clear. I want to be thankful for that. So Samuel will be down here. If you want to come and have a chat to him, uh, by all means, come make the most of that. Uh, if you want to head home and catch the... Uh, 8.30 movie, you've got five minutes. Uh, who watches movies anymore anyway? On demand. Uh, and, but I want to just say thank you for coming tonight. You have shown tonight by your presence some concern and interest in where Islam is at and wanting to see uh, God and the gospel, Jesus and the gospel, known both in your little world and in, a, in the big world. So thank you so much for tonight. It's been great to see you. And um, we'll see you next time.